Good morning, Jason here, Birchfield Family Farm, Oxford, Ohio. Good word for today is Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before obscure men. Okay, we are out here today needing to do a cattle and sheep move. They are noisy. Today, I think we've gone a little bit too long here, doing a, a three-day rotation, quarter acre paddocks that show you uh, what we're going on to here. Let me get over the fence here, we'll take a closer look. Okay, went back and looked, and it has been 32 days, 32 days since we have moved on to uh, this. And you can look right down the fence line here and see we grazed this, uh, we grazed this really heavy. And uh, we got our dozen dozen St. Croix ewes and seven head of Red Devon cattle. And three, I'm gonna go ahead and say three days right now in late August. That's proven to be too much. But uh, heading over to this stuff here, taking a look. I mean, you can, yeah, you can hear them too. They are, they're hungry. So we'll, we'll get them moved here. But just taking a look real quick before I do, we'll get, We'll get a couple days out of this, two maybe. Three, I think, is too much too much expectation uh, for this time of the year. But we've got some, definitely got some high spots here in areas, um, which, is, which is good. But uh, so this would be 32 days. It would have been uh, 20, 29. Yeah, 29 days since we've been off of this. So 29 days recovery. Uh, for late August in Ohio, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this, with the way this looks, but, uh, I think, uh, we're getting into that time of year where we've seen the moisture levels drop off a little bit. <laughs> Come on, Am. Wrong way. Come on. Now, I find it interesting as a, a grass farmer uh, producing beef and lamb to ponder the nomenclature of the weed. This term that denotes something undesirable that's that's growing. The implication is they have very, very little value. You know, I've, I've, I find it interesting because I, I think value, value is really determined by the perspective of the one doing the valuing. Uh, you think about somebody in town, they're not using uh, grass to, to feed animals, and you would look at something maybe like clover, even alfalfa, and consider it a weed, right? You don't want that because you wanna, depending on your goals, uh, but you want a, a mono culture, you know, you want all grass because you want it to look good. You want to maintain appearances in that setting, at least for some folks, not all. But it's interesting to, think about the weed and, and out here, you know, we've come to value <clears throat> a lot of the plants that grow that people in town uh, may consider weeds uh, because they're valuable uh, for feeding livestock. Even with what we do, there's still plants that you look at and you're like, okay, no, I don't, I don't want that around for uh, whatever reason, usually because it's harmful to animals or there's little to no uh, feed value uh, to that plant. Uh, one of those plants is giant ragweed. And I've heard the row crop farmers around here in this area really complain about, you know, some of the resistance that they see in giant ragweed, um, the resistance to the, the chemicals. I came across a tidbit this past week and take this with a grain of salt. Um, I do not know this farmer, but he put out some data on Again, I've always considered giant ragweed to be a pest or a nuisance. He sent a sample in and had it analyzed. Uh, it was a farmer out of Kansas, and he put out this analysis. As he was analyzing leaves, not necessarily stems or the entire plant, but leaves. And, but he was posing the question 
of why don't we include giant ragweed in our warm season annual forage mixes. Whoa. His ragweed, he said, was at the time of, of testing three to five feet tall, and he said they were had been in a very hot and dry spell for about a month. And it came back with almost 20% protein and like 70, 71% uh, total digestible nutrients. Uh, that just blew me away. Almost 20% protein. Uh, again, I don't know this this person, but I thought the, the analysis uh, if nothing else, uh, very thought-provoking. All right, a little bit of giant ragweed here. Mm. Look at that. Nuts. Okay, as we fill our elevated IBC tanks here that feed our automatic portable water with our buried water line, uh, that feeds our paddocks. As we fill these up, let's uh, talk a little bit about a question that continues to come up over and over. Um, people looking to get into rotational grazing, looking to start doing this, seeing the, reading the benefits, seeing that, whatever. It's how big are your paddocks and how often are you rotating? Uh, we get that question all the time. So I thought, uh, you know, this past week, the kids and I had a really unique opportunity. Uh, we got to do a, a plane ride, a flight, I got to take them up at the local airport here, and the pilot uh, was kind enough to come over and fly around uh, our farm here, and I got some shots of that. I thought, you know what? This would be the perfect video, the perfect time to show from the air exactly what, what we're doing. So let's take a look here. I'll show you this footage, and we'll go over this. Hopefully this answers some questions for folks. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> some aerial shots of our paddock setup. That's paddock number one there in the red rectangle. The black towards the bottom is the neighbor's property. The green on the right is uh, our ground, but we rent that to a local cattle farmer. This next shot is our 10 quarter acre paddocks. Uh, again, we try and spend about three days in each paddock, depending on the season. You can see in paddock five there, uh, our cattle and sheep uh, towards the left, kind of neat. Uh, this last shot is our 10 quarter acre paddocks uh, with the water line running down through the middle. You can see that placement with the water hookups there on the, the blue dots. Got the woods on the left. Uh, again, three days in each quarter acre paddock, about four acres total here. We originally started with the eight quarter acre paddocks in the middle here. We added paddock two and three on the north side as we got more animals. Uh, the woods on the bottom is about an acre and a half. It has been great. It allows us to, to kind of press pause, put the brakes on for a while uh, when we need to quicken the rotation, like right now when it gets dry. As with all of our other videos, it's important for me to note here that I am not suggesting that anyone cookie cutter copy what we're doing here. Uh, it's quite a bit more complex than that, and it may work for you, it, it may not. What I am saying is that rotationally grazing has been a definite fit for us in our location versus just continuously grazing or just turning animals out. Uh, we've seen about uh, double the productivity uh, on our ground versus just continuous, continuously grazing. So where do you go? What do you do if you're looking to get started in rotational grazing? Well, talk to a local farmer. Talk to your local extension office. Figure out your normal stocking rate. Start there. I'm confident that you'll only see improvements over that continuous grazing model. Hey, thanks for watching today. I uh, hope you are blessed today. Hope you have a, a great day, great week. Uh, we'll see you next time.